This episode of New Politics was released on the 17th of February, 2024, and produced on the lands of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, the ongoing adventures of Barnaby Joyce, the right to disconnect seems like a good idea, but the Liberal Party wants to oppose it. Peter Dutton and the leftover scandals in home affairs. Julian Assange might be on his way home soon. And the last Liberal Party in the land is going to the polls. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, chief political advisor to Peter Dutton. And just our regular message, if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through Patreon or Substack, or you can go to newpolitics.com.au and purchase one of our books. And all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. Parliament is continuing to sit in Canberra, and as usual, there are so many issues that have been prominent during the week, but the issue that overshadowed everything else was the drunken behaviour of one politician whose political career should have ended a long, long time ago. And whenever there's talk of a politician being drunk in public, there's usually just the one name that comes up, and that's Barnaby Joyce. And people might think, well, there's a whole lot of other issues in the world to worry about, let's move on, this person is not worth worrying about anymore, but the behaviour of Barnaby Joyce, who was drunk in public on the streets of Braddon in Canberra, is about much, much more. It's about the double standards of politics. It's about drugs and alcohol in Parliament House. It's the soft treatment that conservative male politicians always seem to have when it comes to bad behaviour. And it's also the type of people that we should have in public life. And the public role for Barnaby Joyce should have ended many, many years ago. His supporters, his dwindling supporters, will probably suggest that I'm obsessed with him because some years back I wrote an article for New Politics saying that his political career was over. And I have no reason to think that I was wrong then, and I have no reason to think that anything's changed. He sort of crawled his way back into being shadow minister. Every now and then he makes noises that he'll be returning to the leadership, and every now and then he's told that he will not be returning to the leadership. He's really just hanging around in Parliament because he's got nowhere else to go. He can't get the consultancy work that many of his colleagues have gone to and are going to. He can't work for Gina Reinhart's company. Her children will have said many times that they would refuse him being anywhere near it. He couldn't set up as an independent lobbyist because his reputation is not strong as someone who's effective. So he's stuck there in opposition. Now, he was seen drunk, mumbling obscenities into the phone, lying on the ground in a very unseemly manner. I think it's a mistake to judge him for being drunk. It would seem there's talk that he is probably an alcoholic. And alcoholism is a disease. And we can no more judge him for being alcoholic than we can judge him for having, say, Parkinson's disease or cancer or the common cold. However, it's clear that a man with young children that a man with other responsibilities needs far more help than he would have the time for in his job. But that's not why he should stand down. Plenty of people get treatment for alcoholism and and other addictions and still manage to maintain a high-level full-time job. He should step down because he's not very good at what he does. Well, that's precisely the reason. And there is that issue of different political leaders being treated differently. And Barnaby Joyce is excused, and that's for any sort of behaviour, whether he's drunk in public, whether he's drunk in parliament, sexual harassment, womanising. And But as you rightly point out, it leads into all of these other issues. There were all those water licences that were never fully explained while he was minister. There was all that purchase of land in the Narrabri region once he got inside information about the plans for gas fields and train lines being constructed in the area. There's the $670,000 paid for drought envoy reports that have never been seen by anybody and more than likely don't even exist. There's a whole lot of other reasons for why Barnaby Joy shouldn't be in Parliament. But The former Australian Green Senator, Lydia Thorpe, she was involved in an altercation outside a Melbourne nightclub last year. And the Prime Minister at the time said that he hopes that Lydia gets some support. 
and he thought that that level of behaviour was quite clearly unacceptable. This time around, he says that it's up to Barnaby Joyce and that he didn't intend to comment on what are clearly difficult circumstances for Barnaby Joyce. Here's a few other words that the Prime Minister added. I think people will also think to themselves, what would the response be if that was a minister in my government uh, being, uh, being seen uh, to be behaving in that way? Uh, I think that there just needs to be an explanation of what occurred and we need to see uh, the response of the Liberal Party and the National Party leaders. People will make their own judgment on it. And here's Peter Dutton doing a bit of spinning, trying to make Barnaby Joyce the victim and also trying to make it seem that it was all the fault of the Greens and the Labor Party. It's pretty rough when people are walking past somebody who might be in need of support to understand that a chalk mark has been drawn on the footpath. Uh, it could only happen in Canberra where all those Greens and Labor staffers are. But uh, I'll have a chat to Barnaby this week. And as you said, uh, David Littleproud spoken with Barnaby and he's going to speak with him as well this week. And... Uh, uh, that's where the situation's at at the moment. And the media has ramped up that victim card for Barnaby Joyce as well, as if to say, oh, well, it's just Barnaby being Barnaby. Well, what a great retail politician he is. So there's always an excuse for Barnaby Joyce. He's the maverick, he's the bloke, he's the conservative. But for someone else at the other end of the political spectrum, Indigenous and speaking out of turn, a woman, left-leaning, there just seems to be quite a few different rules that do apply there. Whoever filmed it, and I, I do see the argument that it probably shouldn't have been filmed, except that he's a public figure who has appeared to be drunk in Parliament during work hours, and that instead of filming him, he should have helped him. Nobody helped Brittany Higgins, who was, by her own admission, very drunk on the night that she was assaulted. It's clear that Barnaby is a belligerent drunk or gets to the point where he becomes a belligerent drunk. Helping him may have seen him swing a fist at you or... And as the guy who took the film said, he was comfortable, he was lying down, he didn't seem to be in any distress. It was better to just walk on. And video record it and release it to the media as well. To the media. Now, they tried to suppress it. The Daily Mail picked it up. And the Daily Mail, terribly, is not a substantial paper, shall we say. But slow Slowly, the mainstream media has picked it up. I did think at the time, hold on, this isn't really the guy who filmed it doing. I mean, he filmed it and sent it through. But all political parties have fixers who are able to intercept a lot of this stuff. And it's only the stuff that they want to get through that gets through. So I suspect that somebody in the National Party, and it may be two or three people, it may be the whole lot, have decided that Barnaby isn't going to be protected like that anymore and it's time for him to um, at least leave shadow cabinet and possibly even leave parliament. I have no proof that this is what happened. I've just found it interesting that other politicians can do minor, relatively minor stuff like that and it gets swept under the carpet. Deals are made, we'll give you exclusive interviews or, or what have you and it doesn't see the light of day. Now the Daily Mail may not be part of that, they may not have people in the Daily Mail, etc. But it has creeped onto mainstream media. Again, Barnaby Joyce's moral failings aren't really in the drinking, which is probably something he can't help. They're in the dodgy deals, the hypocrisy, the corruption, the incompetence, and all of those things. That's got nothing to do with the alcohol. There are plenty of high-functioning alcoholics who behave more or less well. They just can't control the drink. And that's the other thing too. For a while, I doubted he was talking to Vicky Campion. She said he was. As I go through, I think he probably was just ranting to her on the phone. Well, if it was Vicky Campion at the other end of the phone, I'm not sure why Barnaby Joyce was calling her the C word, but that's a different issue. But David, you did refer to the article that you wrote back in 2018 about the demise of Barnaby Joyce. And I think we both actually predicted the end of Barnaby Joyce back in 2018. I think it was one of our first podcast episodes, and I think it's still available online if anyone wants to go back and listen to it. But six years later, he's still here. And if anything, his involvement in corrupt activities and his personal behaviour has become even more outrageous. His engagement in politics is all about self-benefit, getting what he can out of the system. He hates the Labor Party. He hates the Australian Greens. 
And I'm sure that those feelings are reciprocated, but he's just a maverick idiot whose support in the seat of New England seems to go up every time he's involved in some sort of scandal or corruption or sexual harassment, sex scandals, sex with staff. He also had that citizenship issue back in 2017. But I don't think it's a case where the electorate of New England necessarily supports this behaviour. It's just that it's National Party heartland. And you could pretty much put in a monkey as the National Party candidate or another Barnaby Joyce and they'd still win the seat. And if the Labor Party somehow managed to win the seat by some weird, strange, universal accident, the local member would probably be burnt at the stake. So it is that sort of seat. But even still, electorates should expect more from their elected representatives. And maybe New England is just one of those seats where they just don't care enough, which means that Barnaby Joyce can pretty much do whatever he wants and he won't suffer any consequences. New England has a university. It includes a couple of rather large towns and is a major agricultural centre for the state of New South Wales and for the country. So it's not as if it's a particularly backward seat. Towns like Armadale and Lismore and Tamworth aren't backward hick country towns, as some people would like to denigrate it. It did have Tony Windsor for a while, and in one of the great hypocrisies, Windsor lost one of the elections because a rumour went round that he was having an affair with a staffer, believe it or not. I don't know if the rumours were true or not, and it's none of my business, because whatever Tony Windsor did, it was blown out of the water by what Barnaby Joyce did by giving Vicky Campion the various jobs to hide the fact that not only had they had an affair, she was pregnant. And again, no one cares about consenting adults. It's the rotting, as a few people said, that that was the issue. Tony Windsor never behaved in a way that compromised his position or would have compromised his position as member for New England. And Everything I said before has a big allegedly and apparently, and I've heard this through secondary sources and I don't really know how true any of it is for legal reasons. Hello to our lawyers. It's quite strange how he keeps getting support. And I know that the figure of Gina Reinhart keeps uh, coming up, but surely he must have reached the point where he is of no use to her anymore. And given how her family thinks, I'll be interested to see if he follows what I am told is going to be a bit of an exodus of Liberal ministers leaving at the next election. And while there is pressure on Barnaby Joyce to leave politics, another politician has made the decision to leave completely, and that's Senator Linda Reynolds, and she's announced that she's leaving politics, but not until the next election, and that could be up to another year. And it's like everything else. Once you've decided to leave, you might be physically in that job, but emotionally and psychologically, you've already left. And all you're doing is collecting a paycheck and not doing anything much more than that. And in the words of Scott Morrison, She can go. She's a senator. So it's not as if there's going to be an expensive by-election that she wants to save the electorate. You step out of the Senate, you get replaced by someone else in the party. There might be a bit of internal argy-bargy, as we saw in New South Wales, but that's at the expense of the party, not the public. And it's not that expensive. A, A volunteer panel is convened, interviews are held, background checks are done, and the governor is advised as to who is taking over the Senate position. So I suspect that Linda Reynolds, given her public reputation, is finding it difficult to get another job and needs the 12 months to hopefully get something that will keep her in the manner to which she is accustomed to afford herself. She did a bit of work with AUKUS and there's been a few lucrative jobs go to people who had done that. But given her pathological obsession with Brittany Higgins... I wonder if it's driven by a sense of guilt and a sense of self-justification. But it is interesting that she isn't stepping down to a a job elsewhere. And apparently she engaged uh, French lawyers to continue her pursuit of Brittany Higgins, which becomes just bizarre. Higgins moved out of Australia to France, where interestingly there's no Murdoch media. And again, it's none of my business where Brittany Higgins lives and what she does in private but yeah linda reynolds continued to pursue her and that's probably what's cost a job oh well i think that's 
quite bizarre behaviour as well. And as with Scott Morrison, we haven't got much to say about Senator Reynolds that might be positive. She did become the Minister for Defence, which is quite an achievement. But I think we just have to expect more from politicians than just achieving a particular role. And she was in the position for almost two years, didn't actually do much in the position, but she did have strong links with the defence industry before she did enter the Senate back in 2014 and will probably continue to have strong links with the defence industry when she leaves the Senate. And that's the typical story of Australian politics. But she did play a central role in the Bruce Lerman scandal in 2019 when it seems that the Liberal government at the time covered up the allegation of a sexual assault at Parliament House just a few weeks before the 2019 federal election. And it might also be a case of quitting while she's ahead. But I think that she did go off the rails a bit with the Bruce Lerman trial. There were holes in the defence that she provided to the court. She got her partner to sit in on the courtroom hearings, even though she was a witness to the court. She became highly litigious with a range of defamation cases against Brittany Higgins. And as you mentioned, David, she tried to freeze the assets of Brittany Higgins when she moved to France last year. And she was also engaged in that typical combative liberal style politics that tries to take everyone down with them. And sure, politics is a combative sort of field, but it should be a contest of ideas, not a contest of personalities and a contest of bad behaviour. But she's probably staying in office so that she can manipulate the factions in the WA Liberal Party and orchestrate a replacement senator who fits into her style of political thinking and her style of political behaviour. I would think that if I ever went into politics... It's not too late, David. <laughs> according to all the parties it is, I would be striving for a positive legacy, even if it was a non-legacy. We've had thousands and thousands of members, most leave little mark, but most until recently have left a fairly positive mark, even if it was just their electorates have liked them. You know, they might not love them, but, oh, yeah, no, he was a local member here for a few years. He did well till the government changed or what have you. And, of course, being a minister, you'd think that you'd try and leave the department in a better state than which you found it. Or if it's in a good state, then in the same state. Linda Reynolds, I can't think of any major achievement she did in defence. And, in fact, we're seeing now that the Australian Defence Forces have shrunk because there's just not enough people enlisting. I think there's a whole range of reasons for that. Uh, I don't think we can place it solely on any minister, but certainly the the various ministers of defence over the last few years haven't helped. And apparently there's a bigger senior command than there's ever been presiding over a smaller general army or general defence force. I think too that younger people are turning less to the defence force as a short career, partly because expectations around jobs have changed. And with all the talk to the war with China that the coalition whipped up over nine years, getting shot at is probably not as an appealing prospect now as it might have been 30 years ago. But certainly Linda Reynolds was part of that decline. I can't think of any major positive defence policy she came up with. And if, if our listeners can, please let me know. I'm quite happy to see the whole picture, as it were. Another one who won't be missed. This is New Politics with Eddie Djokovic and David Lewis, one of Australia's top 10 podcasts on Australian politics and news commentary. You can also find us at newpolitics.com.au and you can also support us through Patreon and Substack. The right to disconnect legislation has passed Parliament and as soon as it was passed, Peter Dutton announced that he was going to repeal the legislation if the Liberal Party wins the next election. The right to disconnect is so employees can switch off their mobile phones or not respond to work emails or do anything that is deemed to be unreasonable from their employer outside of working hours, which includes late nights and weekends. Now, This seems to be quite a reasonable protection to have for employees, but as soon as it was announced, the mainstream media outlined all the imaginary problems that are going to be created. The West Australian newspaper ran all of these front page articles that huge problems were going to be caused for parents because they wouldn't be able to contact the school teacher after hours. And I thought that if you wanted to speak to a teacher about your child, maybe you could send an email to the school during office hours 
with your contact number and then maybe they could call you at a time that's convenient for them. Or maybe you could just wait for the parent-teacher night. That's what everyone else seems to do. So this is how it's all playing out in the media. And of course, everything proposed by a Labor government has to be opposed, even if it's a good idea. So Peter Dutton announced that he's going to oppose the legislation. And I guess he just waited to see how this one was going to pan out with the public. And maybe the Labor government should pass a motion supporting Peter Dutton's leadership in Parliament and see if he opposes that as well. And he probably would, because he seems to oppose everything else that's put in front of him. It was a famous, I think it was a Young Labor conference where they voted down the proposition that motherhood was good just because they had the numbers to do that and the Labor left brought it up as a point, yet yeah, this conference moves that motherhood is, is good and desirable and it was voted down. And it's the same with the Liberal Party. In the last couple of weeks, they've opposed tax cuts to everybody, trying to argue that only the rich should get them. <laughs> With the only semi kind of, uh, can, is that the package was already set up so that the tax cuts for the lower paid workers already been gone through and this third stage was for higher paid uh, wage earners, except they were able to give everybody a tax cut and save a bit of money. So again, they had no real argument. And now he's saying that the right to be able to put your phone down, to put your turn your computer off and actually have time away from work should be not entrench. Uh, I can't see how they see this gaining votes. And if I was running a union, I'd suddenly be printing extra membership forms or expanding the server so more. It's just such a bizarre thing. Well, it is. And sometimes it's good for opposition leaders just to sit down and shut up and not waste your time and energy on something so frivolous and just prepare yourself for something more worthwhile. And I've been doing a bit of late night reading recently, David, and in The Art of War, it was suggested that it's best to fight the smaller battles, consolidate over time, and then take on the bigger battles. But first of all, there needs to be a battle in the first place, and then you have to win that battle. And this right to disconnect legislation, I don't think that's even a contest, and it's not really a battle that the Liberal Party can win. And and contact outside of working hours has become an issue since the onset of COVID, and with more work from home arrangements and this type of legislation helps to codify the practice and it's not okay for the boss to ring you up at seven o'clock when you're trying to have your dinner or put your kids to bed or on the weekend when you're trying not to think about work and having this legislation in place might make some employers demand that employees stop working from home and that would be an issue I think but generally it's not really a big deal. Here's what Tanya Plibersek had to say about it. These laws are about making sure that you're not working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, expected to be on call, unless you are paid to be on call. Of course there'll be exceptions to that. Of course you have to apply common sense. But what we're seeing more and more is a nine to five job where you're expected to be answering emails at 11 o'clock at night or five o'clock in the morning. And that's not fair. If you're supposed to be answering emails at 11 o'clock at night and five o'clock in the morning, you should be paid those extra dollars. Your pay should reflect that. That's all that we're saying. That's all that these laws are proposing. And for the Liberal Party, everything is a fight. Everything is a battle. Everything is up for grabs and has to be a contest. And the wise leader chooses their battles carefully and doesn't waste their time on battles that are not worth winning. It reminds me a little bit of the John Howard work choices that brings his government to a crashing end in 2007, in that it was Labor was able to say, under this legislation, you could lose your public holidays. Now, the Liberal Party insisted that they weren't looking at getting rid of Easter Monday or Labor Day or any or New Year's Day or anything like that, that, you know, it was about other things and that a worker could choose uh, to give up certain holidays for more money or for uh, under the law. But the public saw that as, hold on, we're going to lose public holidays here. And 2007, the Howard government lost badly. And I suspect that Dutton opposing the right to turn off outside of work hours by the way. The mobile phone, of course, has been a great boon for employers in that the emails come through 24 hours a day. I don't know how often I've been at a a social event and people have said, oh, I've just got to deal with this email and it's five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. I'm thinking, 
it can't be that urgent if you're an ambulance officer of something happening or an emergency doctor. Yeah, okay. Hard work is great for you, but too much hard work is bad for you and becomes less efficient and people are more prone to mistakes. They're more prone to work more slowly, so less gets done. I think it's going to be another inverted commas, embarrassing backflip trademark for the Liberal Party. And Peter Dutton does have other problems, and not that you'd know from the media, but it's been alleged that during his time as Home Affairs Minister, contractors who were involved with drug smuggling and trafficking of weapons received multi-million dollar contracts from the Australian Federal Government at the time. Here's the current Home Affairs Minister, Claire O'Neill. We are talking here about things like the trafficking of drugs, the trafficking of human beings, uh, the subversion of sanctions against Iran and other criminal activities. Now, this report raises some very important questions for Peter Dutton. This is a system that he set up under the Home Affairs Department. And what we know about that system, it was one in which Australian taxpayer dollars were used to funnel into entities that were using it for criminal conduct. The questions for Peter Dutton today are important. What did he know about this and when and why didn't he do anything to stop it from happening in the decade that he was under the control of this system? And there were also allegations made in Senate estimates that audits were made on the wrong companies and no one in Home Affairs even noticed. And this relates to the Paladin Company, which has got strong links to the Liberal Party. I've raised concerns about the nature of the work of the department under the leadership of the then Department Secretary, uh, reporting to Minister Dutton. But it actually gets worse because the internal audit also found that KPMG conducted the financial strength assessment on the wrong company. Financial statement, strength assessment of, of Paladin Solutions PNG did not include Paladin Holdings, which was actually the company that the department entered into a contract with. Instead, the audit undertaken by KPMG, who were already a, had a conflict of interest, was undertaken on an entirely different company, Paladin Solutions. The financial strength assessment report obtained by the department is not relevant to the financial strength of its contracted service provider, Paladin Holdings. The department noted that Paladin Holdings did not have financial statements. So in addition <laughs> to the KPMG declaration failure, well, failure to manage the conflict of interest, they actually provided an audit statement about the wrong company. And Peter Dutton has previously suggested, well, hang on, I'm just the minister and there's a lot of contracts that come through the department, but under the Westminster Convention, yes, he is responsible. It's the minister who is responsible. And it could be argued that the Labor government is just highlighting these issues now to deflect from some of the problems that they did have within the Home Affairs Department towards the end of last year. But this is a massive scandal under Peter Dutton's watch that not too many people in the media seem to be too bothered by. I wonder how many of them were involved in the initial cover-up. I can't believe that this stuff was completely unknown by them. Dutton, of course, was a disaster as Home Affairs Minister. He changed the Australian Customs Service to Border Force, very quickly known as Border Fast, with their black uniforms and weapons hanging off their belts and, and their inability to actually stop high-level smuggling, etc. The Customs Force may have had its problem, but you turned up to Australia, you were welcomed by a, a person in a new uniform showing that they had authority, but it was generally friendly. If you had anything that you shouldn't have, you were dealt with appropriately. Oh, did you forget to declare that? Oh, yes, I did. Okay, declare it now. And thanks very much. We're going to have to take that. But it more or less worked. Border fast slowed things down, made Australia look like an insecure, small tin pot dictatorship and has basically been ineffective. When we see how Paladin has basically carved it up, taking huge profits for themselves, and the results of this have been embarrassingly awful, I can't see that Peter Dutton can ever become Prime Minister. I think he'll make it to the next election. I don't think anybody wants to take the Liberal Party to the next election knowing that they're going to lose. I think they're going to, to wait 12, 18 months, let him lose, let him stand down, get him out of town altogether and put in someone else and, and then spend the next three years trying to rebuild the party so that they're a competent force for the 2028 elections. I think there probably would have been a feeling that Peter Dutton was allowed to do anything he wanted to when he was the Home Affairs Minister and 
And it seems that it was a combination of wanting to funnel government funds towards companies somehow affiliated with the Liberal Party and also that combination of outright incompetence. But all of this has received little scrutiny. And sure, it was reported at the time, but not to any great depth. And it was almost like here today, gone tomorrow. And anything to do with immigration and asylum seekers, the electorate generally isn't that concerned about. But it is an issue that can easily be stoked by the Liberal Party and by the media into fear and loathing. And the Labor government wants to be careful about not stoking this issue too much. But what it does want to do is highlight the role of Peter Dutton in all of this. And that's to push the idea that Dutton is incompetent and would be a dangerous Prime Minister if he ever got to that point. But they've also been careful not to mention immigration or asylum seekers, and that's why they're focusing on drug smuggling and trafficking of weapons. And they're also starting to ramp up all of this pressure on Peter Dutton and give these free character assessments. And I think this gives us more indications that there's likely to be a federal election towards the end of this year rather than next year. And if that ends up being the case, the government just wants the electorate to know exactly who Peter Dutton is by the time that they get there. They could be doing the um, frog in the boiling water where they've put him in the pot and they've lit the fire. And by the time he realises that there's too much happening, that it's getting too hot, it's too late for him. Whether they're capable of that or not, certainly some of their better performers probably are that smart. I think, though, to go back to one of our earlier points, that sometimes politics shouldn't be this continual character assassination. I think that they should act decisively and quickly and and open up an efficient inquiry to find out the truth of what happened and then hold everyone responsible to account and meet out appropriate policy. This isn't the time for doing him slowly. And the other thing too with Labor, if you were to take over since its first government in uh, 1904 right through to today, the top five achievements, positive achievements of the Labor Party, one of which would have to be multiculturalism and the successful implementation of it. I don't know why Labor is now trying to walk away from that. It's Labor who bring in better immigration law, the economic management. You never hear them brag about the Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan policy of avoiding the global financial crisis. Uh, You never hear them talk about free education, partly because it was them who brought in the iniquitous hex system that the Liberal Party were able to make even worse. You rarely hear them brag about. This is the type of thing that they should be chipping away at Peter Dutton rather than leaking out scandals and letting that drip because those scandals need to be fixed and need to be sorted quickly. A lot of public money and a lot of public trust has been burned by these essentially crooks and we need to fix that. Meanwhile, they should be taunting Liberal with the Liberal Party with how much better, if they can argue that, Labor policy has been for the country than Liberal policy, historically. But there's this fear of their own history, which again is not a Labor trait. And there was a surprise in Parliament this week when there was a motion presented by the independent MP, Andrew Wilkie, and that was a motion that called for the end of the prosecution of Julian Assange by the British and American governments and for him to be returned to Australia. Here's Andrew Wilkie speaking in Canberra during the week. Tuesday and Wednesday, the 20th and 21st, Julian will front court in London seeking leave one last time to appeal. If he is unsuccessful next week, he could be on an aeroplane to the United States within hours. Literally within hours. The time it takes to drive him from Belmarsh Prison to the airport and to put him on a US government aircraft. The situation is that dire. 
the need for action is that urgent. Now, I can uh, tell you today that I will go to London next week. Uh, I'll be in London for a very short time, less than a day, but I'll be there at the court on the second day of the hearing next Wednesday. Because I think it's very important that an Australian parliamentarian and a co-chair of the parliamentary group is there to bear witness. And to support the family and to stand next to Stella and to say that she and her husband and her children have the support of almost a third of the Australian parliament. So even if they've been abandoned by the government, they are not being abandoned by many parliamentarians who understand the injustice of all this. Let's not forget the substantive matter. Julian Assange is a Walkley Award-winning Australian journalist and publisher, and all he did was do his job. And what a chilling signal or message this situation is to every other Australian journalist. Just, just watch out because if any foreign government is annoyed by your work, you may well be abandoned by the Australian government and find yourself shipped off to Saudi Arabia or China or who knows where else that the Australian government might be wanting to curry favour with at that particular time. It could be any of us. It could be any of us. And that motion was successful. It was passed by 86 votes to 42, and that included Labor, the Australian Greens, and the Independent MPs. And, of course, the Coalition and Peter Dutton voted against the motion because every good deed has to be opposed and punished by Peter Dutton. So it was everyone in the Coalition except for the member for Bass, Bridget Archer, who crossed the floor and voted with the government. And Barnaby Joyce, of course, was not in the chamber, and we can only guess where he was. So every good deed needs to be punished by the Liberal Party. Bridget Archer, she will probably be punished by the Liberal Party too for crossing the floor and will probably lose her pre-selection for the next election. But as Anthony Albanese keeps saying, without doing very much about it, Julian Assange has been in jail for far too long. The entire case against him has gone on for far too long and it needs to be brought to an end. One of the things that the Labor Party was brought in to do was to bring Assange home and they've seemingly done very little. Now, I know that the Prime Minister has claimed that they're actually working feverishly behind the scenes to do it and that may be so. It's behind the scenes so we don't know. I'll be really fair and say that's probably the case. I don't think he's lying about that. And of course, under the AUKUS deal given to us by the Morrison government, there's probably very little Australia can do. But I think the parliament was right to support Wilkie's motion. There were a lot of abstainers. Bob Catter also abstained. Okay, Barnaby Joyce was out on sick leave, so I'm not going to... We've spoken about that already. It was quite odd that you'd abstain and not vote no, which means that there's, I suspect, that there's conflicting feelings in your mind. Now, Julian Assange may be the worst person in the world to get on with. I don't know. But that's not a reason to put anyone in jail. If they did, half the parliament wouldn't be there. But it's certainly a, a massive injustice that Assange has spent so long in jail without trial. In fact, he's spent his time there either avoiding trial and trying to delay trial or um, fighting extradition proceedings. Of course, the big fear is that he'll be executed in the United States. And again, for a, a man who, ascent, who did essentially nothing but the job any journalist should be doing. That's a frightening prospect. Even the threat of it is frightening because governments should be held to account. Well, thank you all. I've just returned from visiting uh, the governor who has accepted uh, my advice that the House of, Sem of Assembly be dissolved and that a general election be held on Saturday the 23rd of March. Can I say uh, very clearly, this election is about who is best able to restore uh, stability and certainty. So Tasmania can take action on the issues affecting you right now. We do have a strong plan, which is all about addressing these important issues but the Parliament has become unworkable. I'm not going to allow myself or my government to be held to ransom for the next 12 months 
it's bad for Tasmania and it's bad for Tasmanians. So I've taken the decision to call an election so that Tasmanians can have their say. The Premier of Tasmania, Jeremy Rockcliffe, has called a snap election. It was due to be held in 2025, but he's brought it forward by well over a year. And this is because of the instability of the state government in Tasmania. It's in a minority position after the defection of two government members in 2023. And that was over a wide range of issues, including spending $750 million on a football stadium, even though Hobart has already got one. And who needs health and housing when you can have football? And Tasmania has got the last Liberal government in the nation, and that's across federal, state and territory governments. And there's a strong possibility that after the Tasmania election on March the 23rd, that number will be zero. The big issue is that the Liberal government has got a lot of people promoted way beyond their abilities, and that's generally what happens when there's only 14 people to choose from in the Tasmania Liberal party room. And there's a lot of issues in health, education, housing that need to be resolved, and the current Tasmania Liberal government just isn't resolving any of these issues. And as you'd expect in a small party room of just 14, there's going to be personality differences, ideological differences, and this hasn't worked out very well for the public interest in Tasmania. It's interesting that the University of Tasmania implies that the great thing about getting a degree from the University of Tasmania is that you can move off the island. That's, to me, not a long-term strategy for the future of Tasmania, that you need educated and bright people to stay in, to work in government, to work in not-for-profits, to work in companies, to work in local government. The Tasmanian Liberals are a slightly uh, closer to the South Australian Liberal Party and what I think the New South Wales Liberal Party is becoming a bit more moderate and a bit less crazy than, say, their Victorian counterparts. I had a brief look at the polling last night. Now, one thing is that I've never quite got my head around the Hare Clark system, where you have the multi-member constituencies. It actually does make sense in Tasmania because the population is so small, you'd only have five or six elected uh, representatives, which very quickly becomes unrepresentative. But not understanding the, the the technical details of it as well as I, I should. I can't quite predict with the usual arrogant certainty I do what it'll be, but it looks like that even though when you look at uh, the raw figures, the Liberal Party is a bit ahead, when you combine Labor and Greens, they've got more of the vote between them. And, and again, this is polling too, and there's only one poll that counts and etc. But it looks like that it we might get some kind of a minority government. It does appear that the Liberal government of Jeremy Rockliffe may be finished, giving us wall-to-wall Labor governments, which would be the first time since, yeah, 2008. And the difference with 2008, too, is that the Liberal Party wasn't in the, the dire position it is. It's not coming back to Western Australia anytime soon. It's not coming back to Queensland anytime soon. It's unelectable in Victoria and will only lose more seats. So I think it is quite difficult to work out exactly what's going to be going on in Tasmania for this election. And that's a combination of the smaller population. There's not as much media interest in this event on the mainland as well. But also there is an interesting dynamic that is developing in Tasmania politics. And the number of MPs is going to increase from 25 up to 35. And rarely do you get a lot of public support for an increase of MPs within the electorate. But this is one of those occasions. And there's also the introduction of the Jackie Lambie network into mm. Tasmania state politics. And I've never been a fan of those eponymous political parties like Pauline Hanson's One Nation or Clive Palmer United or Casher Party or Xenophon Team in South Australia. It just seems to be that there's too much focus on the one person. But they are picking up a lot of support, and this is just on the ground rather than opinion polls, but they are picking up a lot of support at the expense of the Liberal Party and the Jackie Lambie network, they're only running in four of the five electorates in Tasmania. And as you mentioned before, there is that complicated Hare Clark voting system in Tasmania. And with the Hare Clark system and the extra seats that are available, and also the mayhem that has been created by the Liberal Party at the moment, it's unlikely that there will be a majority government after the election. It might even be a case where the Liberal Party won't even be in a position to negotiate for a balance of power. 
certainly the figures suggest that, and it's all going to go through. Just one point with the parties named after a person, I take it I can't rely on your vote for the David Lewis Tax Suckers Party, where we just get in and suck as much tax money as we can. We're the only honest party there is. I could vote for that. <laughs> but it is a it is an interesting election. I'm not sure that it will guarantee the future or not of the Liberal Party. If they lose badly, it might suggest that the national mood is that the Liberal Party in its current form has gone. But if they win, it might suggest that anyway, because again, Tasmania is a very small state in terms of population. 90% of it is uninhabited. It's a great state, Tasmania. I've visited a few times and I think it's, it's wonderful to visit. And hello to our Tasmanian listeners. But given its numbers, this is one election where we can say it could go any way and it could go in a way that we don't expect, even though they're only running in four. If the Jackie Lambie network turns up, they could end up winning because you only need you know 51% of the seat and that could happen. But I think the Tasmania election, like depending on, well, of course, we can't say exactly what's going to happen, but I think the Tasmania election, along with the Dunkley by-election in Melbourne on March the 2nd, I think that will give us a good indication of where the Liberal Party stands, and it will also give us a good idea about where the Labor Party stands as well. But these are not opinion polls, these are not speculations, these are real votes cast by real voters in real elections. But I think it's safe to say that all of this trouble within the Liberal Party in Tasmania is not good news for the federal Liberal Party either. And my feeling is that the Liberal Party will not win the election in Tasmania. The electorate voted for Peter Gutwein in 2021. He's no longer there. There's a lot of disunity within the Liberal Party. And generally, the electorate doesn't reward disunity. And although there is that exception of the 2019 federal election, where all the mayhem and disunity within the federal Liberal Party was rewarded by the electorate. But if the Liberal Party does lose in Tasmania, that's the end of all Liberal governments in Australia. And as we referred to before, the last and only time that that has happened was in 2008 for a 10-month period. And then the Liberal and National Parties at that time, they started to pick themselves up and slowly return to office in different jurisdictions. But this time around, I think it just all feels quite different. Everything for the Liberal Party is negative. Everything is opposed. There's nothing constructive. There's an argument against everything, even for the things that would fit into Liberal Party philosophy and even the things that would benefit and be beneficial to the Liberal Party if they did support it. And even with all the support that the Liberal Party receives from the mainstream media and all the support that they receive from News Corporation, next month, the Liberal Party might be a political party that doesn't hold power anywhere in the country. And I think that's a bad place for the political party itself to be in. And I'm not one of these people that thinks that all of this is bad for democracy. I think it's actually good for democracy. A political party shouldn't just automatically get a right to return to office just because they're in opposition. They have to be organised. They need to behave professionally. They need to have ideas that benefit the public. They need to prove to the public that they are worthy of being in office. And at the moment, the public just doesn't believe that the Liberal Party or the National Party are worthy of being in office. And my feeling is that that sentiment is going to continue in Tasmania in their general election in March. I think that's the most likely. Again, I'm, I'm hedging my bets a little bit because I'm not on the ground in Tasmania. And But David, we have paid the big bucks to make these predictions. <laughs> this is true. But also the Hare Clark system can give what we might call anomalous results. I think we'll find that, yeah, the most senior Liberal will be the either the Lord Mayor of Perth or the Lord Mayor of Melbourne. And in 2008, the most senior Liberal was the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, who was Campbell Newman. And that didn't end so well for Queensland. But I think that the Liberal brand is toxic. And I, and I agree with you. And this isn't a bad thing for democracy. If it forces the Liberal Party to be more uh, appealing to the public, or if it forces a split in the party and you get parties that are more representative of their followers, or if it means that the Liberal Party completely dies and a new centre-right party comes through, that's really reflecting the will of the people, which is what democracy is, whatever the outcome is. And we might get rid of more of the dead wood who have helped take the Liberal Party from a, an institution that was reverent and great in many ways to a, a noisy rabble that is really embarrassing to watch. 
That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.